So this is an interesting, you know, timing for this topic in that, you know, given COVID and, you know, work from home, uh, you know, many companies are still, you know, working from home, especially larger organizations have a lot of their people working from home. I know, particularly in, in my own portfolio, we have a number of companies that continue to work from home or are shifting people in and out of the office. So, you know, real estate's, you know, certainly something going forward to think about in terms of, you know, what's the future of it. And um, so I think it's, you know, it's, it's pretty timely that we have a couple, you know, experts today to, talk, to kind of talk about real estate and just the whole real estate market in, in general and investing in real estate and, you know, kind of the economics behind it. But before we get started, I'd like to thank the uh, PVVCA annual sponsors. You know, we wouldn't be here without, without them, their generosity, you know, especially at this time when things are uncertain and we're very grateful. Obviously, we're not able to have in-person events. And um, so, you know, the sponsorship and continued sponsorship of these folks is, is very much appreciated. You know, if you're interested in becoming a sponsor, you know, please contact Mika Whitfield at PVCA. She's the director of business development and let her know. Um, we've got a whole bunch more exciting virtual events in the works. Uh, there's also a free membership uh, for any individual under the age of 40 that comes with your sponsorship. So um, you certainly would appreciate any, any support that, that people, people could lend. Um, so now moving on to today's event, you know, our webcast features, you know, two dynamic speakers. Um, first, Kevin Riley, who's the founder and president of Totem Realty Advisors, and then uh, Jack Surma, uh, who's a senior associate at Tecum Capital. Um, so if you have any questions for our, our panel during this event, please use the Zoom Q&A function and you'll get a response as, as soon as possible. So I'll, I'll turn it over now to, uh, to Kevin. Thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, and uh, very glad to be here today especially for those of you who are taking this all in. As Mike said, it's a gorgeous day. So I appreciate your time and recognize you can be out uh, frolicking in the, the beautiful sunshine that I'm staring at uh, through my window downtown. I think I'm one of the hundred people who's actually in a downtown office building right now, but um, excited to talk about real estate. Uh, just a little bit of background on myself. I've been uh, in the real estate space for the last 17 years. Uh, moved to Pittsburgh about seven years ago and have adopted it as home for myself and my wife and our four kids. Um, love the city and love everything that's going on, both real estate and culturally here in town. Um, last year, 2019, I started Totem Real Estate Advisors, and it really focuses on uh, providing to folks a complete and a holistic view of their real estate exposure. Um, too often the real estate business from our perspective is transactional in nature. And uh, we decided that, oh, getting a little feedback, sorry about that. Um, that a holistic approach was really critical and that clients deserve uh, an understanding of how their real estate decisions, uh, small to big, have dramatic impacts on the value of their business, the success of their um, clients, their success of their employees and everywhere in between. So um, it's been an exciting ride and I look forward to talking to you about what I've learned over those years, both uh, from a tenant's perspective, from an owner's perspective and across a multitude of asset classes. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Jack. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, so a quick overview on, on myself and Tecum. Uh, Tecum Capital is based up in Wexford, uh, just north of the city, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with. Uh, and we come at uh, kind of the lower middle market for more of a private equity standpoint versus venture. So I think it'll be a good kind of interesting melting pot here of, of what different words mean to different people. I always like talking to Kevin and learning about real estate. So I'm looking forward to picking up some new things myself. Uh, but we have a $265 million fund we're deploying out of currently. Um, you're up for a fundraise, which is always a good time in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, and hopefully we'll launch fund three probably uh, mid uh, next year. Um, so I also want to make sure I thank Kevin for inviting me here. Um, he's been a great partner to us on a couple of deals we've worked together on. Wouldn't be here if he, if he wasn't a great partner. So anybody that's actually looking for uh, real real estate help after this, uh, you got a stamp of approval from me. 
uh, and also uh, Kelly, General ACG, and, and PVCA folks, uh, much appreciated as always. So um, we'll go ahead and kind of jump into some questions that, that uh, Kevin and I worked through earlier, but please feel free to uh, use the Q&A tool uh, on the, I guess this is Zoom, I forget if I'm in Teams or go to meeting or whatever we're on here. So please feel free to jump in there and ask questions and we'll get to them as, uh, as we can, uh, as many of them as we can. But uh, sort of transitioning into the, the meat of the topic, uh, Kevin, we, you know how we look at businesses at Tecum, right? We've got multiples of, of EBITDA. A lot of people on the phone probably talk about multiples of revenue and, and different growth, growth rates when they value businesses. But when you or a landlord uh, is looking at a property, I mean, how does the real estate industry think about value versus sort of the traditional private equity or, or venture investor? Yeah, I appreciate that. And I think it is a good segue because I, I have a sense based on my conversations over the years that a lot of people in the VC and the PE world um, don't make the connection to how they look at uh, the value of things versus how real estate owners look at the value of things. And I think whether you're the owner of real estate who's trying to sell something or you're trying to refinance it, or you're trying to increase its value to you, at the end of the day, real estate is valued based on the um, capitalization rate. So instead of a multiple of revenue, it's the, the inverse, it's the division of the net reoccurring revenue that the landlord can create um, over a rate of return that the market has dictated based on asset class, location, and quality um, to then come to a value. And I think that most tenants don't, or I should say, underestimate the power they have by the, the knowledge that every dollar of reoccurring revenue that they provide to said real estate owner increases the value of that property to some extent, um, you know, at a really high profile location and a high class uh, building with great credit tenants. You know, that could be a capitalization rate in the five or 6% range. So for every dollar uh, of reoccurring revenue, divide that by five or 6%, and that gives you the value of that dollar to the landlord. And on the low end, um, in a not so great location, maybe not great credit, you know, it's still probably a 10% capitalization rate. So for every, you know, $100,000 of rent, that's a million dollars of value. So as the occupier of that real estate, you can have substantial leverage in understanding a very simple thing that's almost identical to multiple of revenue or multiple of EBITDA and using that to your, to your benefit in the conversations you have with your landlord. So, so Kevin, you said a magic word to a lot of people on the phone, which is recurring revenue, right? I mean, I, I love seeing it when I pop open a SIM, all the, I mean, venture uh, businesses want to have recurring revenue, whether it's a, a SaaS model or otherwise. So how does the landlord increase their recurring revenue? That's their, that's how they're generating value. They obviously want to increase their value. So how do they get more recurring revenue? Well, uh, the easy one obviously is base rent. And I think that's the one that gets the most conversation. Um, it is what I describe as kind of like cocktail party real estate because everybody knows what their base rent is. Um, and most people in this part of the country know what their base rent is on a per square foot basis. Um, in different parts of the country, they talk about it sometimes in a per month or a per month per square foot basis. But here it's an annual per square foot uh, basis. And then the conversation really stops. It's fascinating um, because it's, well, I pay $20 a square foot for office space. And then the assumption is that the landlord's ability to create reoccurring revenue goes away. And your question is good because the reality is they have many, many levers by which they create reoccurring revenue. So base rent's the easy one. Um, most, I'll stick with office leases here for a second. Most office leases in the you know, Midwest are set up on a full service basis where you pay rent for the first year. And then the second year you're in the space, the landlord has the ability to pass through operating expense increases to the tenants. And uh, that ability for them to basically create a static return 
um, because as their obligations or expenses on the facility increase, they pass that increase along to the tenants, thereby creating more reoccurring revenue. Um, in addition, they have this ability to take those expenses and divide them by the people who actually occupy the building. So in cases where you're in a building that might be 50% vacant, chances are pretty good your landlord is without you knowing it, passing through expenses that otherwise he could pass through to 100% tenants of the building to just the 50% that are left. Um, and if you switch over to the industrial space, which obviously a lot of uh, the viewers on the PE and VC world touch, uh, they have at least set up that typically is a triple net structure where the tenant pays base rent and then pays for all operating expenses on the building. And again, the landlord has protected his reoccurring revenue because he has no exposure to increases in taxes or insurance or cleaning because all of that gets passed along to the tenant. And uh, the third kind of large bucket of revenue that often gets overlooked is the landlord's ability to manage that facility and charge management fees um, for the services that get provided. And by charging those management fees, again, has created a way to increase the value of the property because of reoccurring revenue that's getting paid for by the tenants. So, so all that being said, then the next one in my head is, I mean, we, we know they want to charge for a lot of different things, but I also know when I go to renew a lease or a business goes to renew a lease, the, there's oftentimes TI or some, some sort of incentives that the landlord's given me. So is that kind of just the sweetener to get the hooks in me? Yeah, and it goes to show you how powerful that reoccurring revenue is because if you leave, uh, the cost of replacing that recurring revenue far exceeds the perceived incentive or hooks that he's giving you to keep you uh, in the space. Um, I'll use an example about a project we worked on in Philadelphia. We had a client who was experiencing pretty substantial growth um, unbeknownst to the landlord. And we were in deep conversations about how to deal with that growth. Uh, in the background, the landlord was trying to sell the building. The building was about 85% occupied and a class A office building in Philadelphia is very sought after by investors. And the capitalization rate uh, that the seller was trying to garner for the in-place reoccurring revenue was a 7% cap rate. Um, tenant and I came up with the idea that if he could accommodate their long-term growth in basically the balance of the building, so there was 40,000 square feet remaining, takes the building from 85% occupancy to 100% occupancy, uh, we believe that the value created by us signing a market lease for that space was on the magnitude of about $10 million. So client needed the space anyway, but didn't need it for 12 months and knew that that value creation was going to happen. So um, without the understanding of leverage or value creation, um, you would not have been able to understand the incentives that were offered because the incentives to your question that were offered turned out to be a complete turnkey of the space from raw condition to fully finished as they needed it. 12 months of rent abatement that again gave them the ability to stage that growth that was happening. And um, after some negotiation, which we asked for the five of the $10 million in value creation, they agreed to write our, our client a check for $2 million above and beyond those other incentives. And when we first asked the landlord for the $5 million, you can imagine that did not go over very well. Um, but the bottom line is he understands value and he understood that the ink on that lease was worth 10 million to him. So giving us two, in addition to things he was gonna have to give any tenant anyways, um, it seems without understanding the leverage like crazy, why would a landlord do it? But he did it because 90 days after we signed the lease, he sold the building for you know tens of millions of dollars, but 10 more than he would have otherwise. Does that make so, sense? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, 
Does that that doesn't sound like a deal that I'm going to get done just going to the landlord directly, right? I mean, would I be able to do that? I, I mean, I guess maybe after this call, you're a step closer to being able to do that, right? And that is my sincere hope that at the end of this, everybody has at least one nugget that they can use as they try to leverage their situation. But um, no, I mean, I think it takes a, a lot of experience and a lot of understanding of how landlords work and timing because listen, leverage isn't just about cap rate. There's lots of other market forces happening that create points that you as either the landlord or the tenant can extract leverage. Um, and the more times you've uh, walked through the process, the more times you've seen different avenues by which to create that leverage. So um, much like I wouldn't have a clue really about uh, the best way to analyze EBITDA for a portfolio company that you were exploring. Um, I think we've seen a thing or two about how landlords think and how precious that reoccurring dollar is that we can guide you in the right direction. Well, that's, that's kind of a good segue then because that's what everybody on here is really worried about, right? I mean, how, it, maybe this isn't the expense that we think about off the, the top of our heads every single time as far as rent or a lease goes, but how does this affect the value of our businesses? I mean, I think it's dramatic. Um, you know, one example jumps off the, the page at me and it's COVID related. You know, you, we have a client who has a situation that um, has created a pretty stark vacancy in their building. And I had alluded to vacancy and how it could impact you uh, previously. And they signed a lease, you know, 13 years ago and put it on the shelf and have renewed twice. Didn't really pay attention to what it said. But in that document, it gave the landlord the ability to pass through all expenses of an otherwise occupied or unoccupied building to the tenants that were remaining. So what that means in this example is they got hit with a bill that was the equivalent of two months of rent. Um, and they're already paying somewhere on the magnitude of you know, $50,000 a month in rent. So to get a bill for $100,000 just because of vacancy in the building and have not protected themselves against that, you know, if their business is trading at a multiple of EBITDA of eight or nine or 10, and they just got hit with a hundred thousand dollar new line item to their real estate spend. It just impacted the value of their business dramatically. Um, and if they were in a situation where they were looking to sell their business, uh, you better believe that the jacks of the world would have extrapolated that value out and made sure that they weren't paying for that uh, oversight. Right. So I think it has a direct impact as it relates to expenses. But one thing that we do take a lot of pride in, um, and I'm super passionate about, is that in addition to the expense side of real estate, there's this incredible opportunity with your real estate to drive revenue. And what I mean by that is if you have a more engaged workforce, if you have clients who react to your company in a better way, and if you can distribute your product, whether it's a widget or a service in a better fashion because of the real estate choices that you make, then the incremental cost of the best real estate, and when I say best, I don't mean the fanciest or prettiest, I mean the best to us all for those three things, uh, clients, employees, and distribution, then you have created a powerful tool to drive revenue and therefore, in the examples of multiple of revenue or multiple of EBITDA, the real estate choice um, can have huge impact. Um, and I'll yeah. you, or go ahead. No, I was going to say so. So I completely agree. So the, the then the, the begs the question of how do you assess that kind of total cost, right? So uh, you mentioned earlier the the rent number, the triple net word. I mean, when when I, if I want to get the whole package what do I look at for cost of occupancy or owner or leasing? Yeah. And uh, you just said it, it's total cost of occupancy. It's what are the expenses that I have that I pay the landlord for? What are the expenses that I have that I pay direct for? 
examples would be electricity, telephone, internet. Um, I mean, it sounds like a silly one, but we're working on a project right now where the internet speed necessary to run this business is not accessible at the site. And they signed a five-year commitment for the site. Like that's a major problem, right? And now their total cost of occupancy is gonna take a six digit hit because that was not factored in to the real estate decision. So uh, vendors, like I said, that aren't direct to the landlord. Um, and then, you know, productivity, which is the hardest one. Don't uh, get me wrong. It's single-handedly the hardest one to uh, work on, but depending on the industry that you're in and the type of distribution channels that you need or the types of employees that you have, um, there are certainly tools out there to help assess Will this real estate be the most successful for my company? And, you know, look at the strip district, what has happened there. Um, and it's almost a parallel to what happened in Silicon Valley. You have this perception, right, wrong, or indifferent, that if you're not there and you want to attract the talent that has decided that's the cool place to be, then all of a sudden you're at a disadvantage, right? And if you're not attracting the best talent, then how can you have the best top line revenue? So um, it's kind of long winded and I could probably spend the whole hour talking about just that driving revenue for real estate choices. But uh, yeah, it's an impactful piece of the puzzle. Yeah. For, and one for that sure. few people want to talk about. I, uh, the funniest story, I'll never forget this. I sat down in a major manufacturer and distributor of uh, tires across the globe. And their location, I'll keep it uh, unnamed, but was in the middle of nowhere for lack of a better way of describing it. And I asked the CEO, uh, so why are you located here? And he looked at me like I had three heads. He said, I just wanted you to talk to me about what market rents were. I said, market rents don't mean anything if the logistics of getting these tires around the globe is more expensive than it otherwise needs to be, right? So why are you located in the middle of nowhere? And, you know, long story short, there was no good answer for it, but they then engaged a logistics expert to figure out, all right, all things being equal, what would be the cheapest place in the world to distribute the tires from? And then uh, even though they decided not to move because of some workforce considerations, they had the knowledge to then negotiate a deal that made sense uh, fully understanding the opportunity cost of not being in the best location to distribute tires, right? Wow. Well, and I think uh, just one finish on that is that's what it's all about. The leverage concept that, you know, the whole point of this was is knowledge is leverage. So the more information you have about your business and candidly about the landlord's business, the more uh, leverage you can create on all the different pulleys that are there to drive your business value, which at the end of the day is what matters. Yeah. And that, that's, that, that's kind of in line with where I was just about to go, uh, sort of being aware in the market. Right. And, and we actually just got a question from, from Mike submitted kind of asking on a micro level to Pittsburgh, uh, to the folks that are PVCA members. I mean, how and what's going on in the in the local market today? Is there high vacancy rates or the rents going through the roof relates as it relates to COVID or, or otherwise just kind of general market awareness for Pittsburgh? Yeah. Um, so real estate, because of the nature of its uh, commitments, I would venture to guess that most people on the call have either, a, you know, short term, call it a year, long term, call it 10 years type of commitment with their landlord. And therefore, um, in eight months, which uh, to Mike's question, we've been under this pandemic, real estate doesn't move that fast in terms of vacancies or in terms of uh, price dropping. Uh, that being said, I do expect that over the next 24 to 36 months, you will see increased vacancy, uh, both direct and what I would call shadow vacancy, which is space that's unoccupied and will never be occupied. The company's made a conscious decision never to return to it. And it hasn't even hit the uh, quote market yet because it's still under lease. 
and the landlord back to their problem. They're trying to keep reoccurring revenues. So their desire to have that space on the market is very, very limited. So you get this direct vacancy situation and then shadow vacancy. And yeah, I expect that to increase, uh, not just here in Pittsburgh, but on an office market perspective across the country. Um, and in terms of rental rates, again, it's a slow process, but uh, rest assured, if you're in the market for space today, while there wouldn't be a report on it just yet because of the slow flow of information, um, you would be able to extract some significant um, incentives and some significantly reduced rent in order to occupy space. Because if, uh, if you're in a position that you need to or you want to make a decision like that, you would be the exception to the rule right now in the Pittsburgh market. Uh, we're working on one 40,000 square foot group. They're actually 20,000 feet today. And this is fascinating because it ties into COVID. They feel that that space is too cramped for their workforce. They've got about 120 employees. And the thought is, um, if we doubled our square footage, we could spread everybody out. We could bring everybody back in a safer manner. And our total cost to do that while doubling our real estate spend um, from a total productivity of our company, we think is a good use of funds. Um, and I bet my phone rings every day from the five or six buildings under consideration. Um, and in one sense, it's great for the client. Uh, it is not great for the community that uh, one 40,000 square foot tenant is garnering that much attention. It's indicative of the lack of other opportunities that are out there for landlords. So, so Kevin, 40,000 square feet sounds like a, like a relatively large tenant, right? I mean, how does, do the concepts, everything stay the same if I'm looking for a, a, two, a, a two office little co work space uh, for a thousand square feet? Or is it just amplify when you go up in terms of how large the space is you're looking for? I think it, it, it's the exact same concepts, but admittedly, the smaller that the group is, uh, the tendency by the executive team to pay attention to those things is substantially reduced. And I don't think that's for lack of a desire. I think uh, much like a small business owner myself, you have a thousand things going on and you have to pick the areas by which you can extract the most productivity of your time, right? So um, my experience tells me that the smaller the tenant, the less likely they are to think big picture about that spend. And they spend way more time thinking about how can I uh, have it be short term, which there are some strategies around that. And then also, how do I keep that base rent, which is really what they focus on at a monthly burn that's acceptable to my investors or to my executive team. But those, so even though they may not focus on it as much, it's still available to them, right? So you can still see some of the same benefits just in, on an incremental scale if you're smaller. Absolutely. Um, I think the, the rules of the landlord's desires don't change. They just are magnified by the X factor. Um, and, you know, the thing that the smaller users have that the larger users don't have that usually works to their advantage is flexibility. They can move on short notice. So they're, you know, we like to say that your best leverage is created somewhere in the 12 to 18 month away window. So really understanding where you're at 12 to 18 months from now is the point at which you can control the outcome because it's enough time to achieve results. But if you're, you know, two users in co-working space or, you know, you've got 10 people on your team, it's a lot easier to maneuver those 10 people in 60 or 90 days and to be able to say to a landlord, you can start collecting my reoccurring revenue 30 days from now, 60 days from now, 90 days from now. That's a, that's a powerful thing for a small group. Right. Right. So talked a lot about the, I mean, getting the, the leverage and it feels like knowing the landlord's uh, situation is sort of half the battle. 
So how, how do you know or how do you find out what those pressure points are for a landlord and how do you, I hate to say exploit them, but how do you take advantage of them to, to get the best deal you can? Well, I think um, I'll start with the exploit thing. I, I don't think it's exploiting them as much as it is understanding how to create a win-win for you and for them. Because um, one mistake that we do see often is situations where tenant feels like they got an incredible deal. Um, but when you peel back the onion, it's so incredible that the landlord can't take care of the property. And if they are not making enough money to create revenue for their uh, asset, then, and think of it as their business. If their business isn't making enough money, then what are they going to do? They're going to make cuts. And those cuts then come back and haunt tenant. You know, the roof leaks, landlord doesn't have any money, landlord's not going to take care of it. So I think that it's really important to understand how the landlord makes money, at what point they start losing money, and how you can get to the best kind of inflection point of great for you as the occupier, but fair for the landlord so that he can actually take care of the real estate. Um, and then to the first part of the question is, how do you find that stuff out? ask a lot of questions. I mean, the reality is there's a lot of incredibly free information out there. Just like, do they have a mortgage on the property? What's the mortgage as it relates to the value? I mean, if they've got a mortgage for a million dollars and the property is only worth 500,000 on the small scale side, right? Um, they've got a problem and you want to know that before you engage in a negotiation with them. On the flip side, if it's a large downtown office tower and it's owned by a REIT that's flush with cash and there's no debt and they have a lot of powder dry to do creative things, again, can be really, really advantageous for you to know that. And I, I think the only way you can find those things out is by asking questions, both of them, even if you're going to do it direct, as you mentioned, a lot of people think that doing it direct is the way to go. Um, and there's no shame in asking the landlord, tell me about how you finance this building so that I can figure out, not directly, but indirectly, how you're going to value uh, the revenue that I'm bringing to the table as part of my occupancy of your space. Yeah, and, and it definitely makes sense. And I, I know I've personally, with some portfolio companies, found ourselves sort of thinking, and the grass is always greener, like, oh, we just got to get away from this landlord or this building or whatever it is. And we're trying to do our own comparison. And then we move and the results aren't exactly what we thought that they would be. So kind of that apples to apples, apples to oranges, classical uh, metaphor of we didn't know everything. I mean, how, how do you make sure you adequately address all those things? I mean, do you have checklists or is it just a, a, up in your head? I mean, what, <laughs> what's the way to go? What's the way to go about those evaluations? Um, there's checklists for sure, and a variety of things that you kind of have to know. And uh, you know, the apples to apples and apples to oranges concept is one that uh, we get asked about a lot. And I think one misconception about it is that it's um, you know the type of thing you can say across a wide. Uh, geography or across a wide period of time. We encourage our uh, clients to think about their real estate as it relates to the apples to apples comparison on a yearly basis. Few of them do it to be candid. Um, but my point is the apples to apples thing changes. It's a dynamic market. I mean, the apples to apples only works as it relates to a specific geographic point in time or a specific geographic area at a specific point in time. And I, the easiest way I've been able to describe it is that the moment you're making that decision, you need to know what your next best alternative or alternatives are and compare your total cost of occupancy at that moment in time to those options A, B, and C. And that's how you can truly understand what your apples to apples decision is relative to that market at that moment in time and with those landlords. Because um, back to my cocktail uh, real estate conversations, 
too often you find people talking about uh, per square foot rents in downtown Pittsburgh as compared to per square foot rents in Robinson or in Wexford or in Monroeville and it's apples and oranges. I mean, it really needs to be like quality real estate in the same location um, at the same moment in time because things change. I mean, if you're a landlord, back to Mike's question earlier, in February of 2020, your perception on what was a good deal compared to what you would accept in November of 2020 is drastically different. Right. And, and I mean, speaking from, from our experience, I mean, we, we, we look at real estate usually during diligence, right? So we make sure that the lease is documented. We make sure that there's no environmental issues or claims or anything like that. And we look at it when we're preparing for exit, right, to make sure that, hey, if some buyer is going to come in here, there's going to be a home for the business or do we need to move, what have you. And we look when the lease is coming due. But I'm hearing from you, Kevin, that 12 to 18 month time frame, definitely do it. But even if you're signing a five-year lease, evaluating the market, because the market's going to change in 12 months, whether it's good or bad. But even if you're in a long-term lease, still look at that stuff on a regular basis, right? Yeah, and I think it's fair to have a conversation with your landlord on a regular basis about how the tides have shifted to make things good or bad for your your company and then for him. I mean, at the end of the day, if we're sticking to the concept of how does the landlord continue to keep the value of his business up, he needs tenants and he needs them to be around for the long haul. And nine out of 10 landlords would prefer to have a dialogue on an annual basis about how to make the situation good for both parties, then finding out 12 months before their lease expires that, oh yeah, we're moving and we were never gonna stay here. Like that's like the worst outcome for a landlord, so. Right, and and we got a, another a interesting question in from uh, Mike too about sort of different space becoming available. So, I mean, you, you might, be able to find an, a new space is available if you're if you're looking every year versus you're just kind of sitting on your hands but specific to I mean Pittsburgh again retail and malls I mean what are you seeing out there now versus kind of that February time frame is is it just a, a barren wasteland Simon stock upside down what do you think's coming from that perspective um well I can say of the uh, 17 years of doing this I have just by sheer luck kind of avoided the retail exposure. Um, most of my work is in the industrial and office spaces, um, but enough to be deadly on the retail front. Um, suffice to say, being a landlord in the retail space in 2020 is a very challenging place to be. Um, there were headwinds against retail prior to COVID, right? Um, Amazon effect at every level. I mean, whether it's getting your food delivered from your local restaurant or it's getting your product that you didn't even know you needed on your doorstep the next day. In some cities, not yet in Pittsburgh, but in some cities that day, um, you know, they have disrupted the retail world in a way that was going to cause some substantial winners and losers. Uh, pre-COVID, then you throw COVID on top of it, you have the situation whereby you can't, in some places like Pennsylvania, actually go into restaurants or stores at the capacity that you were able to before. And the headwinds are just, um, you know, my friends and colleagues and uh, peers who are in that environment, I feel for them, especially the end users, the the regional restaurant folks, um, the, you know, I don't feel bad for Costco or Sam's, right? They're going to survive it. But anybody who was making a dent in the community by selling a good or service on a local basis, my heart goes out to them because it's just a very difficult time for them to compete with the easy distribution channels that are out there. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and that uh, is one I wanted to make sure we got to sort of that flexible short-term versus long-term lease or, or mortgage type situation. So, I mean, after this, maybe we'll see more people that are trying to go short-term, right? Because, mm -hmm. hey, if the next pandemic, at least I only have to pay six months rent versus 
signing up for another 36 months. So how, how, how does that work with the trade-offs and, and what do you think about when you're trying to advise somebody on going shorter term versus longer term? Yeah, and I'll just uh, wrap up a little bit on the retail uh, question to your point. You know, how does a retail owner deal with the fact that the restaurant or the clothing shop isn't going to be able to sign a 10 year lease? They, they're not going to be able to do it. So I think you're going to see um, a reversion back to percentage rent deals, which uh, they historically had a lot of traction, then they lost a lot of traction, but I think that comes back whereby landlords are saying, just come into the space. I've figured out a way with my lender to not uh, be exposed on my value, but I can't have everything here. As you had mentioned, uh, barren wasteland, right? I need bodies here. So instead of charging you base rent, I'll only charge you rent if you actually sell things. Um, so I do think that's how the retail space will try to address it. Um, and across all the other platforms, the challenge is, um, as we talked about reoccurring revenue equals value, right? So if the owner doesn't have any debt or doesn't need to go borrow any money, then short term is fine because, uh, you know, we're selling an asset actually this Thursday and about 80% of the revenue in the asset is on a month to month basis. Um, has a lot of storage component to it and, you know, storage in general, short term self storage is a hot commodity across the country um, and trades at ridiculously uh, low cap rates. And you say, well, that's all short term, right? Um, so that doesn't make any sense because on the other side of your mouth, you're saying you need, they need long term stabilized income. The difference is with short term self storage or, um, things of that nature is it's sticky. Once someone stores something, they don't move it or they don't have a tendency to move it. So the long-term lease isn't as critical. Um, the large office user or large industrial user moving to our previous comments is a really difficult thing to do. And landlords who can offer them the spaces they need have typically lots of debt that they have to deal with. So uh, it's really hard to make for a big company, a decision of the magnitude that it would be uh, on a short-term basis. So I don't see that changing. I mean, I think there will be people on the outliers who do short-term things, uh, especially right now, kick the can down the road. If their lease is expiring now, they might kick the can down the road for another 12 months and see what 2021 brings. Um, but the smaller users, the startups, um, and the guys and gals who are saying, you know, we need, just need to be nimble for the next, you know, six, 12, 24 months while we ride this out. I think you're gonna see a lot of staying at home. We've had a lot of people just, they had short-term co-working leases and they said, you know what? We don't need space for the next six or 12 months and we'll reassess at that point. Um, so I think it's a, a question that will come back to how big is the organization and how flexible can they be and how flexible can their landlord be? But sure, long-term sure. leases aren't gone, that's for sure. Well, so we all know what happens like best laid plans, right? I mean, even if you have, you come up with the best strategy, you think you have the best rationale, you get a good deal, something might happen. I mean, you, you never know, the sky starts falling again. How do you think about exit strategies for if you do a deal and 18 months later, you have a reason to get out of it? I mean, what, what, what levers can you pull there? How do you go about trying to, to make that happen? Sure. Uh, well, first thing you have to do is before you sign that deal, you have to have a conversation about exit strategy. I think uh, too often it's the perception that the rose is, you know, it's always perfectly sunny outside. But um, I think that the most strategic occupiers of real estate say to themselves before they sign on the dotted line, if everything changes overnight, how do I deal with the exit of this real estate? And if they do that, they make sure that in their lease or their purchase of that asset, they have um, coverage over what I would call their basis, right? So if you're buying a piece of real estate, you wanna make sure that you own it at a value 
that even if everything turns upside down, you still have an opportunity to survive and thrive on the backside. But more applicable probably to this group and to the smaller uh, organizations and footprints is negotiating terms like favorable sublease language. Um, sublease language sometimes isn't even in leases, which is really bad. But if it's in there, it's often very landlord friendly where the landlord has a lot of control over saying yes or no to the said subtenant. But uh, as a tenant, you wanna make sure that you have as much flexibility as you can to say, this is no longer working for me and I need to go find other people who would appreciate this space and then uh, sublease it to them. We're seeing a tremendous amount of subleases hit the market in Pittsburgh, which back to the previous question, you haven't seen it directly impact vacancy rates yet, but it will because those spaces, um, I feel like there's a new one each day. Um, so then you also have this assignment and transfer provisions, which sometimes gets lost, you know, especially germane to this group. If you're um, a startup and you're expecting at some point to have a liquidity event or a transfer of power, leases sometimes control if you can do that without landlord consent or with landlord consent. And I strongly believe that landlords should have no control over whether or not you sell your company, right? Um, and, you know, the last one, which is always the hardest one in times like these, it works when things are going great. I mean, in 2019, this was a better strategy, but in 2020, it's tough. Just a direct conversation with the landlord about uh, a negotiated uh, release of the lease so that instead of being on the hook for the remainder of the term, maybe you're only on the hook for the uh, present value of what those payments would be to the landlord over the period of time. So those and, are the ways. And that last one, Kevin, I mean, you're essentially a buyout. So you, you owe them X thousand dollars every month for the next five years. You can try to come up with some number, whether it's a strong discount or no discount at all to right. offer them to just make to everybody go their separate ways. Yeah. But uh, rest or, you know, without a doubt, the point at time where you have the most leverage on your exit is before you enter. Um, because when you're up against it and you need to exit, it gets a lot more difficult to create any leverage at that point. Right, right. Well, I know we sprinkled in some, some COVID stuff throughout here, but do you see any of the, the general paradigm shifting as a result of this? I mean, when you're going into those initial negotiations, is, are, are market terms going to change to a new market, whether good or bad for, for tenants or landlords? I think uh, they will change to benefit the tenant because I think a lot of tenants found out about clauses in their lease that they didn't know existed. Um, I think that when you turn the world upside down, figuratively and literally, in the course of a month, um, the rent payments don't stop. So I would venture to guess every executive at every company anywhere, not just in the US, but globally, pulled out documents and leases that they had never read before. And um, were asking questions about things like exit strategy, pass through of operating expenses, um, you know, force majeure, like they glossed over those when they were signing those leases. and my gut tells me that this won't soon be forgotten from a tenant's perspective. And when they go to sign their next lease, they will be forward thinking about those issues. So for landlords, I think the paradigm is definitely shifting even more towards educated tenants who it's gonna be more difficult for the landlord to, uh, one of my colleagues always says, landlords are great at giving you a dollar, but taking 25 cents back without you knowing it. And I think, a lot more eyes are open to that today than were in February of this year. I, I would uh, I would definitely agree with you. Um, so let me let me go back and you said earlier the kind of give some people some nuggets to take away. Uh, I feel like you and I personally have had this conversation a handful of times, but can can you give the the different types of leases? So triple net versus gross, and just kind of get like the elementary school version. Sure. 
Absolutely. We'll start with the absolute easy one, a gross lease. Um, they don't happen very often, but a gross lease is I have a monthly rent spend that is the only thing I'm responsible for. And if I pay that monthly spend, call it $5,000 a month, the landlord is responsible for absolutely all of the services that are necessary for me to do my business. So landlord covers uh, roof structure, taxes, insurance, maintenance, electricity, gas, uh, janitorial. Um, the only thing that wouldn't be included typically in a gross lease would be your phone bill or your internet bill. Um, but all other expenses uh, paid for by the landlord after you pay your gross rent. Okay. After that, kind of the middle of the road. And I guess let me preface this by saying there's variations all over the place, but the next kind of middle of the road is what uh, most people would refer to as a modified gross or a full service lease where you have a base rent that you're responsible for. And then there would be one or two, three things maybe that aren't included. For example, electricity, janitorial, um, insurance, or taxes. One of those things, not all of them, but one of those or two of those don't get included. And it's usually based on the type of construction or the type of landlord that you have. Um, they identified areas where they just can't include everything. So they um, leave a few things out. And what happens there is you pay your base rent and you pay for those things. But in addition, you typically pay for the increases to the landlord's expenses on all other things. So if it costs $10 to run a building in 2020, and in 2021, it costs $12 to run that exact same building, and uh, I'll come back to that in a second, um, then you, the tenant, would be responsible for the $2 delta on a per square foot basis moving forward in 2021. Um, and then the kind of last, uh, kind of big picture lease for the three big buckets is a triple net lease and a triple net lease, as I had mentioned earlier, is you pay your base rent and then you're responsible for absolutely all other expenses. Um, hopefully not marked up. Usually, you know, if you're paying attention, you'll make sure that they're not getting marked up by anybody, but all those expenses that the landlord would otherwise be responsible for, taxes, insurance, maintenance, janitorial, utilities. I promise I won't ask you that until the next time we work on a deal together. <laughs> sure. Hopefully I'll absorb some more of it. Uh, we we, we got investor, another- Just on that front, if you're an investor or you're thinking about being an investor in real estate, um, it, the one that is the easiest to value is the triple net lease because it has the least amount of changes to recurring revenue. So um, the it's a really market specific thing. Pittsburgh has a tendency to be really heavy on the full service office lease basis and triple net on the industrial basis. But there are markets like Chicago, for example, which industrial or office or retail, all of them are triple net deals. Um, so it really just depends on what geography you're sitting in. Um, and one gotcha. thing that I touched on there about how could one building cost $2 more a square foot in the example of 10 to 12, I mean, that's a 20% increase. I think if you're an office tenant today, um, be prepared for increases in operating expenses because there is no way that landlords can deal with the COVID implications, uh, both from a cleaning and security and preventative perspective without having increased expense. It's just, it is absolutely going to happen. You cannot uh, believe that they'll be able to clean and secure buildings in post COVID world the same way they were able to in a pre COVID environment. Well, that, that's so, uh, it that prompts a, another interesting question we just got in about sort of the, the future of layouts. I mean, uh, if it's an open concept uh, or a warehouse, people sitting on top of each other versus 
taking that extra five, 10,000 square feet to give everybody their socially distant zoned. Do you think that's what's coming? Or are we just going to snap back to, to normal and have people in sardine cans? I, I don't think we see a snap back to normal. Um, I think, and clearly the jury's still out on this. There's way, we're way too early for the data to be in, but my instinct based on conversations with clients and just general human decency. I think that um, we had got to a point as an occupier of real estate that it was okay to make people feel like less value than they probably were worth. I mean, I remember walking through many client spaces where their team, you know, they might have a four by four desk with no walls anywhere and it's this whole open concept and everybody working together. But the reality is, you know, when you're looking for a job and you don't have a lot of choices and the market is just, hey, all the companies I looked at, they're all sitting in, you know, sardine cans, then you don't have a lot of leverage as an employee, right? Um, but I think a situation like this gives the employees a lot of voice as it relates to their employers. Um, I think that if the employer determines that having everybody in the office is critical to the success of the company, I think there'll be people who do that and people who don't. But for those that do decide that being back in an office setting is critical, I think they're gonna have to listen to the workforce. And I think, uh, it's not unrealistic to believe that most people are gonna say, I want a little bit more elbow room. I want some private space. And I could see the um, amount of private walled spaces or cubicles that go all the way to the ceiling um, and have doors on them. I just think human nature is going to drive, you know, employer XYZ, if you want me to work here, I need some elbow room because I need to feel safe and that's gonna drive design. I, so well, my answer is I think that the human side of it from the employee up, not from the company down, will drive it. Yep, and I would say that we've probably seen a fair share of both the, the CEOs or the presidents that uh, are more old school, right? And want people in the facility to foster some of that collaboration while being safe about it versus some that are embracing the work from home or at least for a, a portion of the workforce, whether it's the kind of sales or marketing type folks, but it's gonna be, uh, I think at the lower middle market side, maybe a little bit of a reversion to the mean of, um, you have a, a flex schedule where you can do some of both, but uh, lucky for us, this is being recorded. So our <laughs> prognostications are, we can refer back to in the future. Um, right. but, no, I was just gonna say, I think that kind of, work brings us close to the end here and happy to kind of run through any other questions or kind of just bring bring mike in to uh wrap it up for us it sounds good unless any last words from you kevin or, or if happy to no like you said if anybody's got a question obviously uh fired in but it's been a pleasure i really appreciate the opportunity um i think it's a great organization that we as a firm are excited to get more involved in and, you know, real estate is what gets us excited every morning. And, you know, it's back burner for a lot of things, but I think you can, if you uh, pay attention to it, you can really drive the value of your company, both from an expense side and from a more profitability due to a better experience for uh, the workforce. Yeah, and, and uh, just for, for the group again, uh, highlight, Kevin's a fantastic partner and, and helps a lot with uh, this stuff, takes some stuff off of my plate while we're looking at deals and um, couldn't give enough of a personal recommendation there. So hopefully that's a, enough of a plug. And I mean, we look at a lot of deals and Kevin is probably the most responsive diligence partner we've got, which is saying something in a world of uh, diligence partners that uh, are kind of stepping over each other, but local guy and, and does a great job for us. So um happy to kind of field any other reference calls there but uh, and then thanks again to to mike and kevin for having me and, and pvca and, and kelly and all around much appreciated yeah Jack, thanks very much for uh 
moderating and directing the conversation today. It's terrific. Um, Kevin, thank you for your uh, sharing your wisdom and knowledge of the real estate market. I know, um, it's, you know, it's good to hear, uh, you know, from an expert. And uh, I, I met Kevin, not just as an aside, I met Kevin earlier this year, kind of pre-COVID. And, you know, for anybody, uh, he really does know the real estate world in, in, in space. So I also uh, would, would highly recommend him as someone to talk to if you're trying to figure out uh, your next move or your, your real estate space. So thanks very much, Kevin. And, and once again, Jack, uh, greatly appreciated. Thank uh, you, so thank, thanks everybody for attending today. Uh, there'll be a survey link that'll get emailed out, uh, you know, following the webcast. So your feedback's greatly appreciated as we move forward. Um, you know, due to kind of our, uh, our COVID situation, uh, our next PVCA event is the annual Economist pa panel on January 14th, 2021. And uh, in the meantime, we wish everyone well, have uh, wonderful and safe holidays. And, you know, thank you all again for joining and, you know, enjoy this beautiful day in Pittsburgh. All right. Have a great day. Thanks, guys.